so where I'm going to start this morning is is actually um, where Paul left off on the Microsoft Information Protection slide, and that is around our data classification. And the, the reason that I'm actually going to start here is that you know enabling employees with all the online tools that can be accessed anywhere inherently brings you know a risk of all the data exfiltration to the organization so inside of risk management in microsoft 365 i can correlate those signals from a user's windows desktop such as copying use uh, files to USB, as Paul mentioned earlier, emailing personal email accounts, as well as HR activities, and we start to bring those in as part of our HR connector. And then, you know, other third party tools, such as things, you know, coming in from other third party uh, cloud apps um, that we could use our cloud app security, our office email data, our SharePoint. Uh, but before we kind of really want to go into that is I just wanted to quickly show you this data classification pane, because really, as soon as you've got an E3 license, what it's actually starting to do is actually bring across all the information that you have in your tenant. So this isn't even setting up any policies. This is none of those different types of things. If you just have a blank tenant by default, it will start to scan everything that you have inside your tenant and pick out the sensitive information types. So we have about, you know, within Microsoft 365, we have uh, 200 plus sensitive information types out the box. And then we can use um, all the other tool sets in Microsoft Information Protection to pattern match all of those. And the reason I'm kind of bringing that up now is these are the signals, these are the things we're actually going to be able to surface in insider risk management. So it's really, really important for you guys to be able to see where we're actually getting some of that information from. So what I'm going to do now is pop to inside a risk management. So this is within our compliance.microsoft.com. So this is a bit like the, uh, the, the, you know, the security portal. And this is our, um, our main page. Uh, in these demo tenants, it does take a little while to kind of pop up. So some of this part of this page is actually still in a little bit of preview. And you can see the line at the top as it's starting to kind of load up a little bit more. And the reason I'm kind of going to just sit here and wait for it to load is it's going to show us the top actions to help you get started. So this is something brand new that just kind of appeared in the last couple of days. So I'm really glad to be able to bring that to you guys. And what it really does is it kind of takes us through those first initial steps to onboard inside a risk management. So it's a really easy way for you to kind of get started it tells us that we need to turn on the auditing so without auditing we're not going to be able to collect all of that information it tells us that we need to get permissions to set up to run inside a risk management it tells us then that we need to set up those policies indicators so all those policies that that paul talked about or the different types of ones that we actually run in the environment it tells us which ones and how long each one of those is going to take and whether or not they're required or optional so it's a really easy way to kind of get started We've also like a little video as well. So if you want to go and watch that, that's fantastic as well. Have you a bit more of an idea around what to do with the product uh, when you're starting to learn? So, uh, you know, a couple more things on this overview page is, as Paul mentioned, the demos do tend to run out of information if you don't keep them up to date really quickly. So I spent a bit of time last week trying to build up a few things. But as you can see, unfortunately, I've only managed to get one alert in here, but at least we've got one. Uh, and we have some active cases as well, which I'll talk to you about before that I managed to generate a little while ago. But in your environment, um, you'd probably see a little bit more data. But I think really what's, you know, the most important thing, uh, you know, from a compliance perspective is that we have anonymized the users in the environment. So we want to be able to see the data first and investigate it before we reveal, you know, and we, before we know whether it is intentional or unintentional. So this is kind of going to prevent the bias around it. So we don't want the investigator to see if it's a case, if it's a friend, if it's their manager. We want to remove that potential bias uh, from our uh, from the um, portal, but also from an identity perspective and from a compliance perspective, we really don't want to be sharing that information. So that is really, really, really important that like most of our products, you know, we can keep this anonymized and keep that privacy here. And I think that's a really, really, really important uh, point, you know, when we're talking about this product as well. Um, what's also great about this is we can see the risks level uh, of that particular user. So like some of the other tool sets that we actually have, this is based on high severity within the organization. So what types of activity has the user been up to? Has he been exfiltrating all that data? Is he copying it to USB? Is he taking some of our IP different places that he shouldn't be? Is he perhaps, you know, communicating or doing some bullying that we've picked up within communication compliance? So it's really all of those different types of things put together um, that will make up this risk level. 
So again, we can't see what user that is, but we can see the risk level of that particular user. Uh, we can also see the policies with the most activity. So we can actually see what's been going on in the environment as well. So it gives us a bit of an overview around some of those policies that I've set up. But most importantly, down the bottom, if it's actually come up, yes, the gods are, are, are helpful to me today, is how we can actually see from a preview perspective and have a look at what activities are going on in the environment. So when you set up inside a risk management and you turn on auditing and those other tools at the beginning, what you can do is then come right down to the bottom here. So it makes it really easy to get going is come into this inside a risk management analytics preview. And what this does is it goes out there when you first set it up, it takes about 24 hours, it says 24, 24, maybe a little bit longer in a demo tenex or a little bit throttled. But really, it picks up the insights of what's going on over that last seven days. So again, from a demo perspective, if you're talking talking about building a demo, you really do have to keep on top of, you know, um, doing demos and things uh, in order to generate that traffic, as Paul said. But from an overview perspective, we can see uh, a very high summary of some of those user activities that have actually been detected inside that environment. So we can see here that 50% of the people in my organization have performed exfiltration activities. And that's based on certain users that are being scanned. And it's also telling me what policy it recommends I should go and start setting up. So it's a really great insight just to get started at the very beginning before I've even deployed it, before I've even done any of those things. So it's a really easy way to get going. What we can do then is we can also see that highlighted version of those top exfiltration activities. So we can see the recommended, which is to set up a policy, but we can also see what those users have been doing. So they've been downloading SharePoint files. They've been sending emails to people outside of the organization as well. Uh, and the more activities we have, the more would actually appear in these tiles across the side here do is we can have a look and we can kind of go a little bit further into the details and what's also doing is making it really simple for us to go in and pretty much create a policy straight off the bat so you don't really need to kind of you know be learning about the entire product we're really starting to kind of help you guys kind of go and kind of create that pock and kind of move that first piece forward so here we can see the policy that it's recommending for that particular um, threat that we've actually uncovered there is actually data leaks and we've got general data leaks here and we can see what the prerequisites are and we could go ahead directly and build a policy straight from this analytics page which makes it really 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 easy but what I'm going to do is I'm going to close it here and I'm actually going to take you to the policy page so that we can actually see all the different policies that we actually have in the environment so let's quickly see if it's going to play ball today and switch to policies and it'll come up hopefully in a second. It's going to be good with a live demo. Just let that load for a second there. Here we go. So we've got a different couple of different policies in my organization. I've got some for departing security users. I've got some disgruntled user violations. I've got uh, employee theft. Um, I've got some GDPR ones, so some specific ones that I've actually set up for, for specific reasons. But I can see what status, so I can see whether or not we've actually got anything going on with those policies at this high level. So that will kind of link us to alerts, which we'll come into in a little bit uh, further uh, when we get a little bit further down into the detail. We've also got the users in scope. So what users does that apply to? Is it applying to everyone in my organization or are there specific users in scope? So we can lock it right down from that perspective. We can see if we've got any active alerts, um, any actions that might have been taken on those alerts and whether or not the alert policy is effective. So we're getting a bit of an overview here on all the policies. But I'm just going to take you through creating a policy to give you an idea around some of the templates that we've actually got out of the box. Now, there's quite a few. So we've got uh, data theft, so data theft by departing users. So this is one of the ones that we were recommended uh, in those earlier recommendations for us to kind of move further forward. And we've got some optional prerequisites. So if we're thinking about data theft, we're thinking about, you know, has a user left the company? And as Paul mentioned before, are there disgruntled users? Is there anybody out there that's had a poor performance review? So Office 365 or Microsoft 365 isn't really going to know that information. So we do have some optional HR data connectors that we can actually use to kind of import those resignations and import those events 
into this environment so we can actually overlay that uh, against the timeline of, of all the different activities that we're actually bringing in as well. So we can also detect activity on devices. So this is where we're talking about that um, DLP endpoint manager and then also the, the um, endpoint client, so the defender for endpoint client as well. But we've also got this other connector in here called a physical badging connector. So as we're all starting to kind of move from, you know, back into a hybrid uh, environment as well, let's say, you know, you have a particular computer room or a particular room where you might have a lot of documents in or, or, or whatever it is that you want to protect, you can also use our physical badging connector as well and link up a badging system. So if a person went into a particular room and opened that door, we could bring those events in as well. So starting to make it really powerful from a triggering perspective and bringing in all that analytics and alerts. It's also telling us what we would actually trigger that event. So, you know, again, it's kind of saying, well, HR data connector, you know, bringing in those, you know, resignations, terminations, all of those things. But it's also now got the ability. So when a user account is deleted from Azure AD uh, and the scores are assigned when a user account is deleted, we can also kind of bring that event into it as well. So it's a fantastic way to kind of being able to trigger that, especially from a test environment, but also if you haven't got the time to set up the HR connector as well. What it's going to be bringing in is those detected activities. So we're looking at, you know, people downloading files from SharePoint, printing files, copying data to personal cloud uh, uh, storage devices as well. So there's quite a lot going on in this particular template. We also have ones for data leaks, so we can see the ones for disgruntled users. So this one will be bringing in things from, say, uh, a communication compliance tool and some of the other areas. Um, and we've also got some new ones that are, that, are, that are in preview as well, where we're being able to kind of look at that from a general security violation. So bringing in the Defender for Endpoint piece and, you know, the physical badging connector to actually see what else is going on. So there's quite a lot um, from uh, a policy perspective that we can start to use by default out the box. So if I kind of just put this one and we're just going to call it test policy, so I'm probably not going to save this one. What we can choose to do is we can include all the activities in the organization or we can start to specify specific users or groups. So if there's something going on that we wanted to investigate, we're able to kind of, you know, you know, reduce that number down. So I do know that there are, you know, some areas within the world where they want to be a little bit more careful around who they're looking at and what they're trying to do. Even though we've got that anonymous view, sometimes we might want to kind of lock that down to a particular group of users. So what I would do here is let's pick a couple of users that we might want to monitor or, you know, a couple of people within the group that we might actually want to add. Uh, we can add some different groups and things as well. So, you know, let's add in, say, the operations team and we're probably not going to do the leadership team, but let's maybe have a look at the retail team and add them in here as well. So what we can then do is, well, what are we going to prioritize? Is there anything in particular we want to look at? So do we want to look at specific SharePoint sites? Is there a particular SharePoint site from a, you know, a, an IP perspective that we want to be monitoring or looking at or particular sensitivity labels or anything like that? Or we might want to come back and, and do that a little bit later. But let's say we want to lock that down. We then have the ability from a SharePoint perspective to prioritize different types of um, files within those activities or those different types of um, sites that we might have set up. So I might want to just choose all the sites in my uh, demo environment because I actually don't have that many. We can have up to 50 SharePoint sites for this particular policy. I don't have that many in my demo environment, so I'm just going to pop them in here. So we can add all of those ones in as we go. We also have the ability to choose different sensitive information types. And if you think about that data location that I actually had in there that was a sensitive information types. So we would look for different types of things within our organization. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to choose a couple of different um, sensitive information types that are kind of out of the box. So part of that, you know, templates that 250 plus templates that we have out of the box that are already part of Microsoft information protection that you can start to see here. So if I chose, say, as I am based in the UK, I'm going to just look for all of the ones in the UK and I want to focus on looking for that particular content um, that people might be sharing or if it was EU, you know, we've got them all over the world. 
But I'm also going to add in something that I've built myself. So we've got a sensitive information type within my demo environment, and I'm looking for things around pharmacy. So, you know, maybe I was working on the vaccines or maybe I was working on something in particular. I wanted to know whether or not that information is actually going to be looked at as well. And I can create my own sensitive information type in that data collection a data classification uh, dashboard in, in those sensitive information types. And we can use that tool, uh, that um, Microsoft Information Protection um, classification tool and it will go out there and have a look for pharma across my organization. And then I can use this sensitive information type within all of our different rules. So here we can see we've got lots of different sensitive information types. And again, we don't have to focus on anything in particular. I'm just showing you the possibilities of the things that we could add. We can also look at it from a sensitive information uh, label type of thing as well. So where Paul mentioned, um, you know, we had um, general um, highly confidential or confidential, I think it was, and um, you know, public. Uh, I've got a couple of sensitivity labels that are set up in my environment as well. So we could look to choose a couple of those different ones if I wanted to and add those into what I'm actually going to be looking for as well. So it's pretty granular on what we can do. We can also then go in and trigger those events based on different types of policy indicators. So we've got a lot of policy indicators out of the box. So at the moment, within what I've chosen in those previous tabs, I can only collect data information, data connector information from the data connector uh, tool around you know, what would be triggering that event. If I wanted to do user account deleted from Azure AD, I need to enable that for all of the users. So you could set up multiple different policies to do that, but we could go back and just go in and choose all users rather than specific users, and that would open that particular one out as well. But let's have a quick look at some of the office indicators. So we can do things like, you know, trigger when somebody shares a SharePoint file outside with people outside the organization, when they're sharing it with data with content inside the organization. We can look at when they're downgrading sensitive information uh, labels. We can get it when they're removing labels. We can get it when they're deleting files, granting access. So downloading content from Teams, um, you know, sharing folder links from, from different teams through Teams channels all coming soon. There are so many different um, uh, office indicators that we can start to move in. And these are being added all the time. So these weren't here last week. And so these are ones that are about, you know, sharing links with people outside of a Teams private channel. So, you know, let's trigger and, and pick up on some of these other events. We've also got the device indicator, so the endpoint DLP piece. So where Paul mentioned, you know, copying files to a USB, where we're using Edge to copy files to personal storage, where we're creating hidden files, for instance, renaming files on a device, you know, reading sensitive information. We can really pick up a lot, um, you know, on what we actually might want to pick up. We've got physical access indicator. So that's kind of looking at physical access after termination. So if somebody left the company, we've inputted those HR events, what you know, other types of things might we want to pick up. We've got the cloud app security piece. So talking about, you know, how do we integrate other multi clouds into the environment? So, you know, pulling down, you know, triggered uh, information around unusual mass downloading of content from a connected app. Um, there's so many different types of things. And then we can think about the secret detection. So, you know, what types of activities, you know, one performed after the other might suggest a different elevated risk. So I think you're starting to see the power and how much we've actually put into this from a machine learning perspective and how much you can, you know, change and modify these, you know, depending on what your customer might want to actually pull out as well. And then we've got the risk score boosters. So I think if I take you back and you remember that user's risk score that we actually had at the beginning, we now have the ability to actually boost their risk score if any of these are triggered as well. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea around some of the policies that we can actually look to put in in the environment. Just going to cancel that one now, and then we're going to take you. Ah, oh, there was one other thing I was going to show you, which I forgot to show you. Where was that? Uh, that was the custom indicators. So let me just pull one of these back up, and I will go straight to that policy because it's a little bit quicker than me building that particular one back up. Let's hope this is a policy that I've actually got that's working. 
Tamam. Oh my god, there we go. Let's just go down a little bit further. And what we can do, for some reason it's not in this particular policy, but what we can do is we can decide whether or not to use the uh, default or custom threshold indicator. So I for some reason, I cannot find that particular slide, so I'm just going to bring this particular one up. So there is a bit when you're actually going in, I think it was chosen which particular template, maybe I probably chose a different template uh, to what I was actually looking for, but you can actually also decide whether or not you want to use customer indicator thresholds. So we can actually specify those custom thresholds right down to how many events do we want to trigger. So if you're building a demo environment, I might only want to trigger that with one or two events so that I can show you what's going on. On. But in a live environment, you know, depending on how many users, you might have different types of things that you might actually kind of want to lock down and, you know, generate, you know, depending on a different type of environment, different types of thresholds would be more appropriate for each one. So let's start to have a look at when we actually pick up some of these events and actually bring you back to the overview uh, and start to drill down from an alerts perspective some of those other things that we want to show you. So one quick second, I just seem to have lost my notes. Okay. Right. So let's go in quickly and actually have a look at some of the alerts that I've got in my environment. So this kind of gives us an overview and we can see how many alerts we're actually getting in here. So at the moment over the last week, I've only managed to actually produce one. So obviously I haven't kind of set those triggers to be low enough with the, uh, the events that were actually going on in my organization. But again, we can see a list of the alerts that have been going on. So some of these are, you know, four or five months ago, but they will still appear in here, but just not on this particular graph. But what's really, really important again is to kind of point out the anonymity, I really struggle with that word, um, around what's actually going on in the environment. So the, the admin user, the person that's actually looking at these policies can't see what's actually going on, uh, or who, who those particular users are up there. But what we can see is the status, so we can see what we need to do something about it. We can see that this one's become a case. So we can actually see that this has actually become a case. So we can see those ones have turned into a case, but this particular one needs reviewing. So we could look to turn this into a particular case um, if we felt that the, the alerts that were actually coming into this particular um, in, in, in for this particular event uh, were worth us turning it into a case. So we can see here, with, you know, within the alert, we can see what triggered the event. So we can see the HR uh, connector um, imported uh, that I ran, um, and this said that the user departed on July the 24th. So well, hang on a second, if the user's already left the environment, but they're starting to access these sensitive information files, then I really want to know about that. I really want to probably actually go, well, do you know what? This really should be a case. I know it's only one event in this environment, but you know, the user is actually handed in their resignation. They've probably left the company. Uh, but they're actually accessing these files. So maybe there's a user within the environment that wasn't terminated uh, within Azure Active Directory and they've still managed to get access. So we're probably going to want to go and create, create, you know, create a case based on this particular event. We can also see in the Activity Explorer what's actually happened over a period of time. So we can start to see, and I'll, I'll show you from a case perspective how this sits over a timeline, but we can actually see you know, what's gone on to trigger this particular alert. So we can see that files have been deleted on the endpoint. We can see that there's been exfiltration um, you know, via a USB device and lots of different files have been deleted all since that person handed in their resignation. So there's been a lot of activity. So I think that really warrants us creating a case and trying to work out what's actually going on in the environment. So if we didn't think it was a case, we could dismiss that alert, but I actually think that's going to be a case. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in here and we're going to go give it a new case. And I think I'm up to six or keep forgetting my naming scheme. So I'm going to call that CRM case. And I'm going to go, um, 
user left environment. Um, and we could put this, um, you know, investigate. And this will go into our case notes. I can't type today. This will go into our case notes. I still can't type. There we go. Doesn't matter. Let's click create. And what this will do is it'll create a new case for us and we can start to work on that. We can assign it to different people and we can start to look at it. So let's actually go to open that case and start to have a look. I'm probably going to delve back into one of my older cases because I've got a little bit more information on. But well, let's have a look at this one uh, first and we can delve a little bit into the action. So again, we can see here the user's risk score. So we can see at the moment this one's 10 out of 100. So, you know, it's, it's risky, but, you know, maybe there's been less activities than we actually thought. Um, you know, let's do a little bit more investigation on this particular user. Um, these are the policy matches that we've got. Because it's anonymized, we can't see what organization or the manager's name or the email's name, uh, the manager's email, uh, but we can unanonymize this for one particular user. So if you, if they had agreed and you had the right rights, we could unanonymize just for that particular case to actually see what's going on if we could confirm that that particular user um, and we need to do some more investigation. I'm just going to pop to one of my other cases because there's not much in this particular one. So let's just pop back to one of the other cases that I created and let's pop into number four here. Let's have a look in here and have a look in here and we can see a little bit more of the information around this user risk score. So this user has got 100%. We know that there's an awful lot going on. We know that this case has been going on for a while. Uh, we know which team is actually, uh, you know, uh, looking after it at the moment. We can see the alerts. So there's a lot more alerts within this particular case. So we can see a little bit more information. But not only that, we can see what's been going on. So we can have a look at the content that's been detected. We can look at the sensitive information types that have triggered this, the keywords that have been triggered, what SharePoint sites have uh, been um, uh, uh, looked at, um, what top recipients, so if there's some, you know, email conversations or communication compliance going on, we can start to see that as well. We can see the alerts, as I mentioned before, that have been going on and we can change, we can export all of these if we wanted to export all of this and pull that into a different environment. We can see the severity and we can see how long ago each one of those as well. Just going to drill a little bit more down into the user activity because I think that's really where it gets starts to get a lot more in, uh, interesting um, from from your perspective uh, around what we can actually start to see. So we can go back six months now so we can start to see the activity over a six month period. So we can start to see, I think this is where inside of risk management becomes really powerful, is we can actually see over a six month period what's actually gone on in the environment. Now, I think if you're pulling out some of those alerts, you know, SharePoint files have been accessed, some files have been downloaded, you know, lots of files have been downloaded with Teams. I think each one of those alerts in isolation probably doesn't make up much of a story. But if we add in things like our, you know, our um, HR connector and we're picking in some of those other activities, this really starts to build up a case. And if we're thinking about, say, IP theft, we've really now got the opportunity to hopefully be able to kind of look at this user activity and do something about it, maybe before a person's actually taken that data out of the company. So we can start to pull down some of these activities. So over the six months, we can see that, you know, where the access has been. So that's the blue here. We can see where files have been deleted, which is the pink. We can see where files have been collected. So they've been starting to do different types of things. We can see where they've been exfiltrated. So where data has been taken out of the environment as well. We can see some security ones as well. If they had some of those coming in, so we can see some security alerts, maybe multi-factor authentication enabled or disabled or any of those other things to start to build up a period of time of what's actually going on, um, you know, in, in that environment. So we can start to see lots of different things. If we then drill down into the Activity Explorer, we get to look at each one of those events in a little bit more detail. So let's, for instance, start to pull in some of those information. So we can change this filter 
back to a little bit earlier. So you've got the ability to change this. And we've also got the ability to change the activity. So if we're looking for something in particular, we can see, you know, when files have been downloaded from SharePoint, sensitive files have been read, hidden files might have been created, sensitive information shared on a Teams message. But let's have a look at what information we can start to pull out and where it starts to become really rich is what activity details. So you're really starting to be able to see when did the event happen? What operation was it? What workload was it? To go back to Lisa's point, what workload did this actually occur in right back in the beginning? So we know that it was SharePoint. We know that the files are being downloaded from SharePoint. We know when it happened. We know the location of the SharePoint site. We know the client's IP as well. So where are they coming from? What were they doing at the time? We can start to see the file information. We can see that it's a file named called 10,099.doc. We can see the sensitive information types that were in that document. We can see the confidence level. So we can see here that they've been pulling out medical terms. We know that they've been taking information around diseases, pharma data. So this is really, really, really important. We can also see the content matches of which one of those IRM policies have that has that user actually managed to violate or do we think they've actually been violated? So there's a lot of information actually being able to be surfaced here as well. From a content perspective, we're able to then also drill down into the content. Now, this doesn't always work from a demo perspective, but let's see whether or not it'll allow us to bring it in. So if I had the correct permissions, I would be able to see the content to which that document is referring to. So let's have a look. Uh, I can today. So I can start to see that the document that they were sharing or that they were looking at was this particular document. So I can really see why that particular piece. And if I try and zoom in a bit there. Oops. And then again. Oh, let's see. Ah. Let's try and zoom in, see if it'll let me do that. We can see here that's highlighted in the purple there, which is just here. We can see the information of why that sensitive information type has been triggered and what we're looking for in that particular document as well. So as you can see, it's really granular. It's using some of the other tools that we're probably going to talk about in advanced audit to actually bring that information. I've also got things like case notes so we can see what's been going on from a case perspective. So anybody who wanted to write a note, we're able to use this as a bit of a case management system and being able to start to add some of those cases around what we're working on as well. We can add different contributors as well. So we can add different people to work on this with us uh, as well. So we can actually start to kind of really build it out from a, um, a collaborative perspective as well. I think what's also really important is what are we going to do about it? So let's have a look at what case actions we can start to do. So we could send an email notice. So we can create templates that allow us to send a template when something happens. So let's say, for instance, a person violated something. What we might want to do is send a template to them to say, well, do you know what? Um, we would want to maybe inform the user that a case is going to be created, or maybe we would want to kind of say, you know, you're not using appropriate languages of communication compliance and create all these different templates. Or maybe we would just want to send a notice that says, could you go and do our standard of business conduct trading because we don't think you've um, read it or watched it. Give them almost like a mini warning, but record that in the system. And if it happened again, we know that they've actually gone into to kind of, you know, been referred to go and watch that standard of business conduct, but maybe they haven't watched it. And we can record that bit of information as well. So you could build some flows in Power Automate to find out whether or not they've gone and done that particular training and then import that back in here as well. So it's a bit of a, a partner IP piece. Some of the other things we can start to do is we could share, so we could send an email, we could copy a link to different parts of this case. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit around what we could do with Automate. But the first thing that we actually might want to do is actually kind of look at that pseudonymize and we might want to actually turn it off. So let's say we actually want to have a case overview and we've agreed we want to see who that particular user is. And if we give that a little minute, what that will do is hopefully, if the demo guards will come back, it will start to build up and we will be able to see that particular user that particular case unanonymized and it's taking its time. 
which is completely typical from a demo perspective. But let's see if we can get that to unanonymize. Still taking its time. So I want to show you the differences before we move on to Compliance Manager, which I'm going to run out of time. Here we go. Let's see here. Brilliant. So now we can see the user that we're actually looking at. So we know that this particular person that's been causing all this trouble within this case is called Kermit the Frog. Uh, and we can see his email. We can see the organization that he's a part of. We can see the manager as well. So we start to see a little bit more information. So let's say we don't know whether this user has been doing lots of tests. Maybe he's, you know, purposely trying to actually trigger some of this information, but maybe we don't really know. So what we can do is we can use a lot of the Power Automate templates and some of these are built out of the box. What I've done, uh, which we kind of recommended that partners could start to build out, is to use some of these Power Platform automators, uh, automate flows. So some of them are built out of the box and I've just modified some of the ones that I've actually built. To, to do what we call inform the manager. So what I want to do is I've built a flow within Power Automate and what I wanted to do is go and inform the manager that Kermit the Frog is actually being brought up from a case. And the reason I want to do that is I want to know whether or not the manager thinks this is actually important. So maybe the manager knows that, you know, he's been doing lots of testing and there's lots of different things going on. Um, so maybe he doesn't really want to actually do this either. So, you know, maybe he's just been doing some testing. And um, what you'll see here from a case notes perspective, is if it's working properly, is that I can see here that the inform manager flow was actually run by me and that hopefully should have sent a message to the admin. Is that the new one? I don't know if this is the right time of day, but I don't think it is. Hasn't doesn't seem to have come in, but we'll use. Oh, there we go. Look, has worked. Brilliant. So what we've done is I've built a flow. It's a little bit ugly, but you can see what we've actually done is that I've said to the admin, dear admin, your direct report, Kermit the Frog, has been flagged for potentially violating the following company policies. So what I've done is we've actually pulled out some of those policies. We've pulled out when they've happened, what severity, and you can start to kind of pull out a bit of a story to inform the manager if it's something you wanted to do from an automation perspective. But what I'm actually asking the manager to do is I'm asking for some feedback. What am I going to do with the case? I don't know whether or not to move that case further forward. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to ask him a series of questions. I'm going to ask him, you know, to select one of my options that I've actually built the flow against. So I've actually got kind of got three choices, which is please investigate further. This is not expected behavior. So we're not expecting Kermit to be behaving like this. We've got an option here of saying the manager will take it on and she's going to talk to the to talk to Kermit and actually deal with it. Or we've got, you know, please ignore it. It was a test. So let's just say we'd like a little bit more investigation. We can see that the flows run now and we can actually see that it's been successfully registered. So if I go back to the case notes and I refresh that, we should be able to see here that that's actually come in. So that actual flow has triggered and it's updated the case notes saying, please investigate further. It is not expected behavior. So therefore, as a partner, you could then start to do you know, lots more different things uh, uh, around investigation and start to do to do those uh, other areas. So hopefully you can see, I don't think I've got too much more time on insider risk management, how easy it really is to kind of get going from an insider risk management, the value and the power and all of the different pieces you can actually start to kind of put together. Um, I'm going to move on to compliance manager now, compliance score um, quite quickly, because otherwise I'm going to run out of time, right, Paul? I think I am. So just going to take you through a couple of other different areas. So we're going to do a bit of a demo on Compliance Manager, but I'll probably just kind of cover off a couple of things um, first. And that really is that, you know, the Compliance Manager also includes Compliance Score. So the number one question when we're talking about compliance is, you know, where do we start with compliance? What do we actually need to do? Um, all of those other different types of things. Um, what do we actually need to do? And, you know, what types of assessments do we actually need in the environment? So the number one thing is, you know, how compliant is the customer? What types of rules and regulations are applicable to them? So here we have over 340 different plus templates that you can use to assess your compliance. And we don't 
I think what's really important to note here is that we don't make you compliant, but that it's a shared responsibility between Microsoft, the customer, and maybe you as a partner, if you provide this as a service. So what we're going to do from a demo perspective is, you know, let you see some of those assessments and how you can use them. And it's not just how the customer meets the control, but how Microsoft can actually meet those controls for you as well. So let's quickly pop over from a, a demo. Um, I think looks like I'm running a little bit over, so I'll, I'll speed up. Apologize for that. I thought I had uh, till four, so pop over no, to. No, no worries, you can make up time in different places too. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Take your time. Cool. So from compliance manager perspective, I'm going to drill straight down into in, into the environment and start to actually have a look. So Compliance Manager is, is part of the whole uh, overview environment. So the biggest piece that we've actually got on the left-hand side, we've got Compliance Manager. So what this actually kind of covers is, you know, we land on this particular page and here we can easily view and assess the overall compliance posture with Compliance Score. So at a glance, this score allows us to quickly understand the progress in meeting the data protection environments and the regulatory standards that matter most to your organization. Here we can see that the majority of the, the actual um, the score that we actually have overall, so we can see this overall compliance score. We can also see the points that the customer is responsible. So as part of this, your points achieved. So we can hear, you can see here that the customer has managed to achieve 1,268 out of a possible 11,678. But we can also see the Microsoft Manage points. So out of the box, you will get a load of um, a load of points that Microsoft are actually looking after and doing for you. The regular Regulations that we actually look after. So things like in our data center, things like our services that we actually run on. So we're actually being able to kind of show those particular uh, compliance regulations and also how are we doing? You know, are we able to actually, you know, are we keeping up to date? Have we ticked them off? You'll be able to see all of those different types of people. Um, so, so we can actually see all of those as well. Um, so by default, um, Compliance Manager gives me a score based on those common regulations and standards. So basically, we, you know, we're looking at data protection baseline, which is a set of controls that includes those key regulations, key regulations and standards for data protection and general governance. And this baseline primarily kind of pulls everything from NIST and ISO, as well as the sum of the, the uh, areas around FedRAMP and GDPR as well. To the right of the score, so over here, we can see the key improvement action. So the things that we actually need to complete. So what's not completed, what's completed and what might be out of scope. And to the right, um, we can actually see the ones that actually need our attention as well. So with all of these attention, we can also see the solutions that affect your score as well. So we can actually put it by, I guess, workload for, for want of a better word, since we seem to be using it throughout the presentations, is each solution that we actually have uh, as well. So let's drill down a little bit more around that compliance score breakdown. So, oops, I should be able to pull down from a solution perspective and being able to see some of these other different areas as well. So we can see all the solutions, we can see the description, we can see the current score, we can see what categories, we can see the regulations, and we can see different groups. There's lots of different ways for us to be able to filter into each one of these as well. So we're being able to kind of break down each one of those quite easily and, and, and quickly. What I'm going to do now, as we're a little bit tight on time, is quickly get to the assessment. So let's jump in and learn a little bit more about setting up an assessment. So here we can select from our, our library of over 150 plus assessments, and then we can modify to suit the customer's needs. Or as a partner, you could build your own assessments to track what's important for your for your customers. So a great way, kind of a bit of IP, a bit of something you can build, is you can build your own templates as well in order to sell those to a particular customer. So if I was going to add an assessment, I can base this on lots of different templates. Out of the box, Microsoft has a load of included templates. Um, in my demo environment, we have a couple of extra duplicated ones, but really out of the box, you get the data protection baseline, we get EU GDPR, we get some ISO ones, and we get NIST. We also have the ability for premium templates, so templates that are used across the world, across different organizations. So let's say, for instance, we wanted to um, 
you know, let's look at all of the ones relating to Australia, for instance, since we did UK, we can see all of the different um, Australian regulations that we might want to actually kind of look at, uh, you know, at, at applying for. So let's say, for instance, take the Australian Privacy Act. We've got lots of templates that are all built up out, out, out in the environment, and this is a premium template. So we would actually have to pay uh, a small fee to Microsoft in order to be able to keep using these templates. But from a demo perspective, you are able to use them for a couple of months in order to be able to test. And we can see what we would actually do. So here I can choose um, an assessment name, and I'm going to call it Australia um, Privacy Act. And I run this assessment using my existing group, and I'm just going to stick it in here. Uh, what have I missed? Let's run it again here. And what it's going to do is it's going to take that template and create that assessment on my actual environment. So as time is, is a little bit fast, we're going to go back and we'll, we'll let that kind of run in the background and we'll let that kind of appear. And that should start to appear in here um, it, shortly. So we'll start to see it here. What's also important to see here is that you can see that these updates are being updated all of the time. So in the background, Microsoft are updating all the assessments because, as you know, all of these rules and regulations change so regularly on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis. It's impossible to kind of keep up. So when one of these actually comes in, we can come in here and we can actually see that it's due to be updated. We can see the changes that have been updated. So we can see a little bit more around that actually regulation. We can see what's in scope. We can see that at the moment the status is incomplete because it's waiting for us to actually update it. We can see the key improvement actions that need to be done for us. But um, we can also see the control status, you know, what's in progress, what's not, as we're actually going uh, along this particular um, key improvement actions. We can see the controls, what each one of these are. So we can see over a period of time all of the different um, uh, control status breakdown. So we can see the context of the organization. We can see here cryptography doesn't apply. We can see which ones have passed, which ones are in progress, which ones have failed. So it's really interesting for us to be able to see each one of those. Can also filter down to control titles so we can actually start to see how many of those improvement actions we still need to complete. So in here we can actually see that we've got one out of 10 that has actually been completed uh, within this particular one. We can see the impact that would have if we actually did go through and complete it. And we can also see if there are any Microsoft actions as well. So we can see that some of these would be completed by Microsoft, but that the rest of them would need to be completed by the customer or yourselves as a partner, if that's something that you guys were looking uh, to, to look at. So what I was also going to show you uh, quickly is, you know, as the new templates come in and as they get updated, um, we can actually see that the updates actually come in here. So we can see the updates. So they're telling us exactly what's actually changed uh, in the templates. We're able to kind of keep up to date. We can see the change details. So we can see the actions that have been done. We can pull down the old template. We can look at the current template or we can just accept that particular update. So you can see how easier it is to kind of use the tool sets to be able to keep these up to date. Just trying to hurry it along a little bit. Come on. We can also see how it is possible for you guys to create your own templates as well. So I quickly just wanted to show you that too. So you're able to actually use a CSV file to be able to export, you know, some tools that we actually have uh, in the environment. So if I come back to the assessments, I can actually start to see how I could build my own template. And as a partner, this is a great added value or something you might actually want to do. So you can come in here and you can create your own template. So. I could use one of the existing templates so I could actually download a sample file. So there's just a CSV file that you can actually upload and edit. And I'll quickly show you what one of those CSV files looks like. Ali, this is this is Paul. Just as a, a brief uh, interruption, you've got about six or seven minutes left uh, and I know you've got a bit more to get through. So just to give you a bit of a time warning before Thanks. the break, I'm sure we can take a few minutes of people's coffee time, but maybe not too many. No problem. I think I'll be done by then, so all good. So just wanted to quickly show you the template. So if you were to take a copy of that template, 
what you're able to actually do is just quite easily come in here and edit it. So you've got um, the template control family, you can choose different certifications, you can choose what services you would want to use in scope. And we can start to actually fill in each one of these templates. So this is one that I pulled directly from the, the, the templated website and you guys can modify it and then look to kind of you know, sell that to different customers as part of an added value as well. So if I quickly switch back to the compliance manager, I could also extend an existing Microsoft template. So I can take a copy of one of the templates that Microsoft has actually got there, so say Albanian, and I could actually extend that particular template as well and kind of make that my own. It's very, very simple. All you need to do is upload your template. So let's say my SOC template. I probably should have chosen a, a SOC environment, but let's just upload that SOC template. Uh, and we could come in and we could see, you know, what improvement changes would need to be uh, made in that particular environment um, and, you know, what we would actually be assessed. So that then kind of brings you to having all of your different assessments. So you would then use that template to create an assessment. So here we can see one that I've already made. Uh, we've got an actual assessment. I made one for my little organization here and added, I think, one or two little controls in here. And I could also update my template. So again, a bit like what we had from a, you know, an update perspective, we can come in here, we can update our, uh, our, um, our controls, but we could see that the template that I've actually added has the list of the improvement actions that I've managed to pop in. So we can see here if we've got a Microsoft um, control that's already there, I'm managing to leverage that and we can see that some of those templates will be updated as part of these other regulations that I've used. But you can see, you know, there's a lot from an improvement action. There's a lot kind of, you know, from your, avail your uh, particular um, improvement action, you know, your own added value, you could really start to kind of, you know, create a lot um, inside that environment. And I think that is compliance manager at a very, very, very quick high level um, that I wanted to kind of take you through. Is there any uh, live questions or anything at the moment, Paul, that people wanted to ask? I've got a couple of minutes Ooh. for questions. We have, yeah. So we've been handling a lot of them for you, of course, as we go through. But Brilliant. Let's see, if we, <laughs> let's see if any of it escapes our, uh, our, our grasp. Uh, is it possible to connect the IRM dashboard into Power BI? IRM dashboard. Um, I don't believe we can at the moment, but I think the point really is that we'd probably look to pull that into Sentinel. So there's going to be a connector for Sentinel. Uh, so you're able to actually pull in some of that information in Sentinel, and that's due to be released, I think, imminently. Um, and then you can start to surface some of those alerts inside Sentinel by using workbooks and things, and you could pull out some of that information from, from that perspective. But there's no API um, for Power BI uh, that you would be able to use to pull in information uh, inside of risk management at the moment. So I don't believe we can do that at the moment. So I believe on, on the imminent roadmap, and by imminent, we generally mean months, of course, is that it will feed in, it will end up feeding into Graph API somewhere. So if, yes. uh, if that stage, you should be able to grab hold of it into, into other platforms like Power BI as well. Uh, and then uh, another one is I'm not quite sure the context of this one. Uh, how are these controls associated with the risks? Uh, I presume these are the controls inside some of the uh, compliance policies. Let's drill down and have a look at one of those assessments. So you're quite right. I was running a little bit fast there and I probably didn't cover each one of those assessments properly around what you can actually do. I went a little bit quick, so I was a bit panicked on time. So let's kind of pop back into the, each one of those controls and each one of those improvement actions and we can actually start to have a look at that in a little bit more detail. So let's say I was going to look at one of those particular controls. So let's bring up one of those. Um, this one is called adopting biometric authentication mechanisms and you're quite right I didn't even cover this because I was in a panic of a hurry so apologize for that so in here we can see the details we can see the points achieved we can see what status we can assign it to different people within the organization so let's say we're going to give this to Megan to be able to go in and look at this particular control so we can assign it to Megan and she would be sent an email to actually go and look at that particular control and start to have a look at that from a risk perspective. We can also start to see 
uh, some of the other different areas around the implementation and testing. I, I forgot the bulk of this. So I'm really sorry. Um, so we can actually start to see the implementation and the testing. So we can actually start to see the implementation and testing so we can see what's not implemented, what is implemented. Uh, you know, if we wanted to do an alternative information, so we had another third party product, we could start to say alternative information. We could see whether we're planning on doing it out of scope. Uh, different implementation dates. And if Microsoft has updated one of these controls, you'll see this for each one of those controls as well. What have we done? The implementation notes, how to implement each of those controls as well. So from a control perspective, we can actually, let's say that this was going to be planned and we could choose a particular date. Once we actually go ahead and do it uh, and we're actually going to run it, we could pop in our test data. So we could you know, choose whether or not it's been planned, whether it's been successful. We could pop in the test date. We could add testing notes. We can see the standards and regulations from a control perspective around each one of those that would actually be being pulled out. And we can also upload any other documents. So from a management system, we can actually see one of those controls. I think that answers the question, but I might be wrong, Paul. That sounded like it to me. Uh, we do have another one though, um, which actually, if you can answer in one and a half seconds, will be perfect timing. Any plans for a multi-tenant version of Compliance Manager? I've been asking. Um, as, as far as I know, I, I, I couldn't say at this particular point in time. I doubt it, because uh, some of the other security workloads we've been asking for some time to be multi-tenanted haven't quite worked either. Uh, and hence why we, we keep pushing back to Sentinel. So that's the multi-tenant solution almost. If you can feed the data into Sentinel, you can multi-tenant Sentinel essentially. And that then gives you sort of one box to remotely control for each customer. That gives you the ability to do multiple customers at a single time. Uh, now, whether the you don't get the full UI, of course, that's just alert management uh, and investigation. At the moment, I don't think there are any plans for multi-tenant within sort of the 365 broader environment. I think also from a compliance perspective, there are different types of things that people need to kind of be aware of. So obviously this is looking at data rather than actual security alerts. So there's different regulations. We do have a lot of different roles. So you can add uh, you know, other different roles um, from other different organizations. So the granularity um, from what we actually used to have before from a role perspective is really granular now. So you can actually lock it, lock it down from a granularity. And I do believe we can add, a, um, we might be looking to add B2B users into some of these groups. So there might be something you could look to do from that perspective rather than say Lighthouse. Perfect. I think we'll have to end it there because we're, we're a couple of minutes over now. And as you can see, um, well, certainly Ali can go on for quite some time. <laughs> she is available for children's parties. Um, <laughs> to go. Um, but of course, what we're seriously trying to show is that there's a great depth to this whole service, of course, and we're just trying to give you an outline today of what's actually possible. As not many people are aware that Microsoft has such a comprehensive solution with compliance. Well, we like to think it's comprehensive, of course. But Tiffany, back to you before I eat up any more time. <laughs> 